What is up, Galaxy Con? It is Kid Cadet, joined always by my beautiful co-host, Danica. How you doing, Danica? I'm doing like the rest of the world's doing. Okay. Kind of here. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're here, and I'm glad y'all are here. Without any further ado, we're going to bring out our two incredible guests. We're already getting our first high. Hi, hi, hi. All right. Without any further ado, let's bring out the incredible Matt Novetsky. Hi. Howdy. <laughs> How are you guys? We're doing good. How are you doing, Matt? I'm doing good. I like incredible. That's awesome. I wish people would say that all the time. I have a lot more adjectives. We'll get to them later. <laughs> all good adjectives. Thanks for having me. Of course. Thank you. All right. Let's go ahead and bring out our next guest, the incomparable, the iconic, David Ellison. Thank you for joining us, sir. What's happening? How are you? Hello. All the great adjectives. Yes. <laughs> More adjectives. Yeah. Awesome. Rad. Incredible. <laughs> Dynamic. So, <laughs> before we got started here, one of my first questions I was going to ask you all is if you had ever met before, but I think we cleared that up that, yes, there's a possibility the two of you all have crossed paths mm -hmm. at some point. Yeah, yeah, right before we got on the chat, um, I was running artist relations, which is like a marketing division for PB Electronics. Uh, it was a big amplifier and PA uh, uh, manufacturing company out of Mississippi. And I remember there was a guy there, Scott Mears, his name, we'll give him a shout out. And he uh, yeah. he actually brought Max Van Blue October in uh, to the company as, a, as, a, as an endorsement, as an artist. And uh, he loved you guys, just raving constantly. So that was how I actually got introduced to you. Uh, and, awesome. uh, yeah. So, and then, and then, as it turns out, you produced a band, a mutual friend of ours, um, um, Chris Cotero, his band Razor yeah. from out from here in Phoenix, actually. And, yeah, uh, that's right. So, yeah. It's, it's, so, and you just worked on something with Bumblefoot, <laughs> <it's> <laughs> right? Right, man. So it's like we just we we have a bunch of mutual friends, and yeah. I mean, but you know better than anybody. It's such a small business, you know. It's like it's a uh, it really is. It's it's um like the two degrees of separation. I mean, everybody knows everybody, especially when it comes to crew, when yes. it comes to like touring yeah. crew, it's like yeah, yeah, everybody yeah. knows everybody, you know? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. It's funny, yeah. Well, it's funny. People see us play our music for like an hour on stage and the other turn 23 hours of the day uh, are all about networking and who, what's going on. Yeah. And Hey, do you want to play on this record? And now in your case, you're producing and you're doing yeah. stuff. So it's uh, yeah, it, it's always that. And now, you know, I don't know about you, but in this this time, you know, with all this kind of file sharing, and, and I hate phoning records in. I mean, I don't. I actually don't yeah. like recording at home and sending it across Dropbox over the yeah. ocean, you know, to distant, faraway places. I mean, it works fine, and we all do it. But um, it's kind of funny. We're probably out of all the industries, probably the early adapters because we were already doing all this stuff. This, you know, video oh, streaming yeah. and sending files across the the world, and I don't know how much of that you've been doing lately. Probably quite a bit, right? Yeah, quite a bit. Yeah. And it's a huge adjustment, man. I'm with you. It's like a, a big part of making a, a record is just that human connection. You know, it's I know. sitting yeah. down with somebody and spending time with them and getting to know them, you know, but I guess one of the good things uh, that I've found is if I already know somebody or I've worked with them before, I think it makes the process a lot easier because it's like, okay, mm -hmm. there's no like break in the ice period now. It's like, I think I know what you're looking for and I think I can, I can deliver that. Right. And, you know, but, but it's still, it's weird. There's no getting around it, man. It's just yeah. weird. You know, it's, I, well, I actually, I, I'm yeah. actually working on a solo album, right? Well, we got a Megadeth album that we're actually supposed to start recording back in March. And now that's had to get pushed down. And I know we're pushed back a little bit and we're, we're chomping at the bit probably in May. We'll see, depending on, how we can travel because we all live in four different parts of the world. <laughs> so yeah. it's a matter of getting, and we don't want to phone that in. That's very much a got to be in the room together. There's obviously a lot of notes and a lot of intricacy to that stuff. So it's not oh, yeah. something that you can, at least I don't want to sit at home and record it and send it in. Um, but also, you know, it's funny I've been working on an Olsen solo record and um, that stuff, even though I wrote, you know, I had a hand in writing all the stuff, you know, I send it over to my friend, um, over in, in, um, uh, my friend and guitar player who I've now deemed my musical director, cause he, he's probably like you, he's better at putting things together in the studio <laughs> than I am. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he said something back, he said something back and I was just sitting here literally get right over. Funny, my computer face is this way. It's a video studio. When I move it over there, it becomes a recording studio, oh. <laughs> uh, right? Depending. <laughs> and, and it's funny. I was working on something yesterday, a song I wrote. And it's just like, gosh, I'm going these little intricacy and details, you know, because, you know, as a player, there's all, all these little 
intricate movements and detail yeah. to how you pick something and is it an upstroke or downstroke did i bounce off the e string here you know what i mean there's all these yeah. little details that really matter when you're recording you can hear everything you know so those oh, are the yeah. moments that I'd, I'd always rather be just in a room jamming with somebody and go, oh because you, you you just see and absorb things differently than you do over video or just only hearing it one dimensionally in the audio domain you know yeah for sure i mean that, that I, you can't like I think I think that it's technology is great, and I think that it's made things a lot easier for us. And yeah. you know, thank God, a lot of people are able to still work and and do what they do. But there's nothing like the human connection when it comes to music, man. I mean, no. it's the same thing with live concerts too. It's like <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with the live streaming aspect of it, and I think that that you're gonna we're gonna see a lot of that. You know, yeah. it's like you're gonna see a lot yeah. of virtual concerts and and stage it and these other things happening, and that's great. But man, that like you know better than anyone it's like I that did a live stream you know a couple of weeks ago for my my david olson youth music foundation we're doing uh mm -hmm. we have an initiative called schools out and it's basically to give free music lessons to, to students 18 and under who are out of school all around the world so we did um basically a, a web version of a telethon i guess a webathon right and we did yeah. it using Streamyard, same kind of thing we're doing here and it's funny i had some comedians on and oh, nice. they, they said it's really rough for them because musicians like we can play and we're kind of engaged as we're playing and then we stop. And it is kind of weird to just hear crickets chirping and not having a roaring yeah. crowd. You know what I mean? But for comedians, it's even more challenging because they really play off the dynamic of every little yeah. you know, thing that they say. They're waiting for a response and that sort of, you know, it, it's interesting how comedians, how they put their whole shtick and their show together, you know, based on a response from an audience. And, you know, you see it. I've been on Jimmy Fallon. You know, I watch Fallon every night and, you know, he'll do yeah. his his opening monologue and there's like no response. Right. And just yeah. like. Was that joke really funny or was it only <laughs> funny because it <laughs> yeah. was contagious in the room because everyone yeah. was laughing, you know? Yeah, uh, it's so funny. So, uh, I, which well, is what it's got to wonder. I wonder, you know, ladies, how uh, how that's going to be for these comic cons. It's so funny because I'm actually going to be doing a few a couple of cons later in the year as well. And I was mm. kind of wondering the same thing. So would you hit me? Um, about coming on the on the stream here i was i was thinking that i was like yeah it's I'm, I'm glad you're doing it because you know we have so much fun at these cons it's very interactive they're colorful they're dynamic and um you know this is at least a way to connect our community the con community you know so thank yeah. you for doing this it's very oh, cool th yeah. thank you yeah galaxy con has been really great about doing these these streams nightly and uh yeah we, you know we get all different you know fandoms from yeah. you guys to anime to star wars and mm -hmm. all that cool stuff but um yeah. david somebody oh, noticed yeah. the big four behind you but i'm noticing yeah. that a grammy it is a grammy yeah i have a grammy yeah we were nominated 12 times and we finally were bestowed the honor um Hell yeah it's an interesting Congrats. thing when you go to the grammys and they say and the grammy goes to not you uh, mm. <laughs> it's obviously it, it's a big lead up but obviously it's like wow you know, I mean, it's awesome to be nominated because it's, you know, in the, in the music world, it is the gold standard and it's it's mm -hmm. like the Oscars, you know, for the film world. And it, it's wonderful. It's, we've been fortunately nominated since, I think, 1991. Wow. So it's just great to be in that, you know, community. But um, but it, it's it I got to say, it, it's better to take one home, you know, <laughs> and it's it's really nice. It's nice to have one. You know, I think probably the, the best part of of winning the Grammy uh, when we did in 2017 for the last Megadeth album for Dystopia was uh, obviously the moment is great, but the moment of course, you know, fades and life moves on. And I think probably the best part of it is I'm now, you know, part of the Grammy Music Education Coalition uh, with my own foundation that I spoke of earlier, the David Ellison Youth Music Foundation. And I grew up in a small town, a little farming community in Southern Minnesota. And so I'm a product of the public music school system. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, I learned how to play tenor saxophone, reading music. I played in orchestra band, marching band, eventually jazz band with my bass. And so I, I learned a lot there, you know, and then when I moved to Hollywood and after I graduated and I met Dave Mustaine, we started Megadeth, you know, I, I had a lot of skills from my, from my education. So as we all know, you know, when cuts come and, Financial cut, cut, you know, cutbacks happen. Uh, oftentimes, you know, the arts and music get affected first. So part of the initiative with my youth music program is to help the, the rural areas. Um, and the Grammys, of course, are great going into some of the inner city, the bigger uh, metropolitan. So, you know, their coalition's really been a great thing to be a part of. And they've been such a huge supporter for us. So 
Um, you know, had I won the Grammy many years ago, obviously it would have been great, but, um, and I guess it's not to say you can't win a few of them over the years, but you know, to, yeah. to have, you know, the honor bestowed on us at, at a little later in our career, I think maybe you're a little more, hopefully a little wiser <laughs> and maybe a little, maybe handle it a little better. And you're maybe a better steward of some of the opportunities that come your way. Um, you know, after you've been in the business a while. So that's one of the things that's really been, you know, it's kind of helped that Grammy continue and move forward and help spread yeah. the legacy out for, to benefit more people than just me. Awesome. Oh, congrats, man. Yeah. That's so yeah, great. You. Yeah. You deserve them all, but you know, I'm glad you got that one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah me too. <laughs> one of my favorite moments ever, it, it, like you said, you guys were nominated, what, 12 times you said? Yeah. 12 times. Oh yeah, my yeah, God. That's incredible, yeah, man. Yeah. Well, like one of my favorite moments ever, just, you know, being a, a music fan myself mm. was when Rush was inducted into the Hall of Fame, oh. the reaction. I mean, it was just like, I mean, I feel yeah. like for me personally, I felt vindicated. You know, I was like, <laughs> All right. yes, like finally, <laughs> you know, so. you know, did you ever hear you know, our friend Eddie Trunk, who goes on Sirius yeah. Radio, you know, he um, he had the president of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame on there. And he's actually a, a friend of me and my wife's um, and uh, Joel. And he's been done a lot of things in the business, um, general manager of Madison Square Garden. And all he's getting a cool gig and a cool guy, you know. And and, and I felt so bad because Daddy was just grilling him about, well, why not this band? And why not that band? And mm. I know why UFO is not in there, but why isn't Deep Purple and Rush? And, you know, right. listen down the list. And so, you know, you're right. And I think now these group they have, I think it was kind of a wake up call, you know, sort of like, hey, include all music, not just sort of, you know, yeah. your own favorite side of your record collection. And, and, and they, and to their credit, they've done a much better job. And it's, it's, yeah, I agree. Um, you know, it, look, you know, Matt, we don't write music to, to win awards. We just write music that connects that we like, it feels good to us. And then we realize it connects with someone else and then it connects to somebody else. And, you know, music is a is a language in and of itself, and when we can communicate it to other people and it and it spreads that out, is is you know I think probably that's our greatest reward. And then when we get the awards, um, is you know again it's just it's just the cherry on top. It's it's I don't know about you, yeah. but it's it's never been the motivator to start doing it. But it it is nice yeah. to get them, I guess, to, if nothing else, to be recognized by the community. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I think this is one of the things that Danik and I were discussing before tonight was obviously you both have accomplished so much in your in your careers, but what would you say has been your biggest personal life accomplishment outside of music? Go ahead, Matt. I don't know. I mean, well, man, I look, I I have three kids and uh you know, being a dad like you know, it's like when when people, you know, your title, your 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 signature on your email or whatever, you go on Instagram and it's like, well, how do I condense my whole life into, you know, what, what do I, what am I? What's my identity? Dad is first. Being a father is first to me, you know, like, you know, nothing in the world is as cool as watching my kids grow up and, and my daughter who's actually here with me, my daughter's playing bass now and I see that she has all these, in, <laughs> these cool instincts and I'm like, oh my God, this is awesome. I get to sit down and jam with her and she's coming up with ideas and like, you know, so to me, like, of course I'm giving you, you know, I'm giving you the answer that I, the, the, that you'd expect, you know, but it's the honest answer is the truth. That's my, my greatest personal life accomplishment I think was, was being a father and, and, you know, just watching my children grow up. Uh, but I, I do have to say one moment that for me personally, just that I feel like I'll never forget that. Uh, I, I mean, I, it, it, it was just so surreal to me was I grew up in, you know, kiss was everything when I growing up, when I was a kid, kiss wasn't just music totally. or a band. <laughs> it was life. You yeah. got up and you ate, yeah. you know, kiss cereal and you, you know, you went to your kiss toilet and you read your kiss comics and everything was kiss. You know, it was like every Halloween. I have an older brother. He's four years older than me. So it was like every Halloween, him and my cousins. And I was the youngest. I always had to be Paul, by the way. But they, we would all dress up as Halloween as uh, kiss for Halloween, you know, and it was like, so I grew up with that. So in 2009 playing at the festival de quebec with them and just hanging out after our set talking to gene in full costume oh my god in full costume right before they go on stage just having a conversation with him and my brother calls my cell phone <laughs> and i'm like my brother is like the reason you know to me he's <laughs> like yes and i'm like dave do you know what i'm doing right now <laughs> i'm talking <laughs> to gene simmons in full costume that's like, I just got to say for like 
cheesy or not, that's a moment that I think will just stick with me forever. That was like a, okay, I, I think I can, I can die happy now. This is awesome. I would probably ditto everything you just said. (laughs) You know, my kids, same thing, you know, you're young, you're working hard and you're doing your thing. And, um, but I remember when my, when my son was born in 1996 and my kids are, you know, 24 and 21 now. And obviously we're all home with the, um, my son, my son's finishing his MBA and my daughter's at ASU in the nursing program. And, Mm. um, Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, it, I remember when his son was born, how hard it was brutal leaving home. We were, we're Megadeth. We were in Nashville recording. We wrote the cryptic writings record here in Phoenix because we, three of us lived here in town. So we wrote it here. Then we went to Nashville and those three weeks I was in Nashville recording that record. And I guess probably September of 96, my son was about six months old at that time. And it was just brutal. And when I came home, it's so funny, my wife and son came down, picked me up at the airport and of course he's just a little, you know, just a little kid, you know, a little bubble in a, you know, in a, in a, in a stroller. And he looked up at me and kind of locked eyes and went, I remember that guy. And he just hung <laughs> on to me like a panda bear and he didn't let go of me. And it just made leaving, leaving home so hard, oh, you know, to, to go on tour. I mean, for the next few years, it was just brutal. And, and of course my daughter was born a couple years later and um, that probably distracted him, gave him something else to play with around the house, right. you know, playing mm-hmm. with my daughter. But, um, yeah, it, it, you know, then that becomes everything, doesn't it? It becomes really kind mm. of the reason. And, um, you know, the Grammy awards are nice, you know, but it's, it's, you know, the kid, the kid awards, you know, because that's, that ultimately is your, your, your bigger legacy, you know? Um, yeah. and I think, you know, you realize raising kids and, and it kind of challenges everything you think, say, and do, you know? And of course we yeah. live in the, in the public eye and the spotlight. So, everything's a little bit under scrutiny, but all of a sudden you realize it's like, you know, what's, uh, especially the internet, you know, the things you think, say, and do stay on the internet. And, and it's, it's, uh, mm. um, I think it, it does, it, it, it forces you to grow up and, and then, you know, in rock and rolls, you look, it's young man's game. It's, it's all about freedom. Like you just said, kiss, you know, mm-hmm. it's like, how do I be a superhero? You know, and they were, right. they were the ultimate superheroes. And it's funny yesterday I was on YouTube and I just stumbled on uh, a great kiss, um, something about like, I don't know, but behind the, you know, behind the makeup. It was, I think it was a VH1 special. It must've come out in 96, right? When they reformed and they got Ace and yeah. back and put the makeup back on. And, uh, and just everything that they said, you know, when Paul Stanley says, you know, we want to be the band we wanted to see, the band we wanted to hear, you know, and it, mm-hmm. I just thought, man, what a great mission, you know, um, yeah. just, we want to be everything that's not out there, you know, and that, yeah. that, that's like true, that's like inventing something. It's like, God, wouldn't it be great if, you know, we had a yeah. phone that also had email in it and da, da, da. so bang, right. Steve Jobs invents the iPhone. You know what I mean? That's like, yeah. wouldn't it be great if we had air conditioning and one day somebody invents air conditioning? It's like that level yeah. of, of just innovation. And, and, uh, I know they were the, they, they, they were my Beatles, you know, they inspired yeah. me for pretty much everything that I do in rock and roll. Pioneers, man, musical yep. pioneers. Yep. So before we get to our game, uh, our buddy Jose wants to know what is your go-to karaoke song? Oh, <laughs> I, honestly, I never sing karaoke, so I, I I can't say that I look. Uh, I can't even say I've never done karaoke. I honestly have never done it, <laughs> so I don't know. The night is young. Look, I'd say probably "Shout It Out Loud" by Kiss because if I heard that, I would instantly know oh, the words. I know the guitar solo, and I'd know the bass line. And then yeah. makeup magically appears on your face. <laughs> yeah, I, I, same for me, man. I have actually, uh, uh, unless I'm forgetting something from my youth, like a night that I don't remember or something, I karaoke terrifies the living hell out of me. Like, I can get up in front of thousands of people and play a show and not think twice about it. If there are 10 people in a bar and somebody said, get up and sing, you know, uh, Billy Joel song or something, that scares the living hell out of me. No. I think Blue October and Megadeth are the karaoke bands. So I there think you that go. Is, I think that is their karaoke. <laughs> That's it. That's perfect. All right. So, Danica, you want to? Yeah. So, we're going to go ahead and jump right in. So, we've got this fun little game. And today, we're going to be doing our version for the two of you of Would You Rather. Okay. All right. So, first things first. Um, this is a, a non visual version so (laughs) you just have to listen to my voice um if you're forced to incorporate either 
a bagpipe or melodica into your band, which would you choose? You well, I'd say the bagpipe's already been done really well by ACDC, so it'd probably have to be the melodica. Ooh. <laughs> That's a good answer, man. But, you know, every time I think of bagpipe, I think of, of, of that Mike Myers movie. Uh... So I Married an Actor. So I Married an Actor. Yes, so Mar <laughs> yeah, such a great movie. Um, <laughs> and, and, and I love that movie, so I'm going to go with bagpipes. Very <laughs> Okay. All right. Oh, this one's, mm -hmm. would you rather have to play an entire song with your bass out of tune or <laughs> have your monitor be half a beat behind? Oh, oh my God. I know. <laughs> Is killing yourself on stage to get out of this a, a third option or not? <laughs> no. I think we've probably done, I don't know about you, Matt, but I probably had all that happen. In fact, I remember very specifically oh, yeah. in two, it was right around when we were doing the big four shows. We Megadeth. We did a one-off show somewhere in Europe, like like Bratislava or something, and it was literally in a mm -hmm. castle. And I went on stage. We were playing a song in my darkest hour, and the bass I had um, was a half step off. It was literally a oh, half step no. out of tune. Yeah. And I was like, "What the heck?" And I and then when I realized, I went, "Oh my god!" And this is a long song with a lot of breaks. I'm going, "All right, this yeah. is either five minutes of hell or change the bass." So yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll take I'll take out of tune. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, I I've been in that same boat. I actually uh, I have a couple very distinct memories of starting starting a song with an out of tune bass and just going, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> do I have to? Do I got to figure this out on the fly or exactly what you said? Do I get? Do I flag down the tech and and change it? You know. Um, and blame it on the tech, of course. Yeah, and blame it on him. It's never, it's never yeah. my fault. Yeah. Yeah. Of course not. Yeah. Um, you know, but uh, I think I think that the I actually think that the monitor thing would be kind of fun. <laughs> I think it'd be kind of a challenge. You know, it's like, yeah, could, could we? Yeah, let's try to make this happen. Let's see how bad I really am. <laughs> OK. All right. Next question. Uh, speaking in terms of film, would you rather write the score for a rom-com or a children's movie? Wow. Well, you know, one of the years I did go to the Grammys, I remember there was Best Children's uh, Album. And the house band, you know, they do some some of the Grammys is televised, of course. And then there's then most of the awards are given out pre-televised in the in the afternoon. Um, now across the street at the Microsoft Theater there by the Staples Center in L.A. And I remember the, the, that particular one, the band, when they said Best Children's Musical, they, the band struck up. Sweet child of mine. And I went, that's a random choice. Whoa. Especially if it's like Guns N' Roses. Not exactly a PG-13 band, right? <laughs> <laughs> so with that, there's hope. So I think I'm going to go for writing the children's uh, children's score. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm going to agree with that one. I, I think that, I think the, the, you know, I love me a good rom-com. Don't get me wrong. Uh, especially the 80s rom-coms. Those are the best, man. Like the John Cusack movies. Um, but but I have to go with the with the children's stuff. I actually really love the classic Disney movie, mm. the classic Disney cartoon uh, animated movies. You know, like those are some awesome songs, man. Do you have I a mean, favorite? Some of them are fantastic. Say Robin. I like the Aristocats a lot. <laughs> oh, actually, I really do. I love the. My daughter was obsessed with it when she was a kid, and Good one. Um, yeah, and I, yeah. I I love the the soundtrack to that. In fact, I have a cat named O'Malley. Oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Would you rather, okay, th th this one's a little eccentric. <clears throat> Would you rather always have to underscore everything you say or never play again? Oh, that's easy. Underscore. Everything? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not playing would be like just sucking the life out of you. So yeah, yeah. underscore is easy. <laughs> underscore is easy. Yeah. Okay. I, I agree 100% with that. I mean, yeah, it, you'd have to. It's like, I mean, playing is like, you know, at the risk of sounding a little like corny or whatever, like playing is really a, just sitting down and, and, and having that, like even just 10 minutes or, or 20 minutes of that time where you get your bass and you play it and you connect with it. It's spiritual. It really is. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's just, mm -hmm. it's so, it's a part of you. It becomes something that you can't live without. You re it really, I mean, I really do feel that way about it. I mean, just the other day I was like, I had a 
crazy day and with homeschooling and all kinds of stuff going on. And I just said, I just need a little, little time, <laughs> a little bit of time. And I went in the other room and I just plugged in and I just jammed for like 15 minutes. And I just took a big breath and I was like, okay, I'm good. I can go back to what I'm doing now. You know, it's like, can't imagine not doing it, honestly. Yeah. All right. It's either that or go to the gym and, you know, like go to boxing or say, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> playing, playing take, 10 minutes of playing takes care of all of that. Yeah, it does. <laughs> yeah. I'm <laughs> happy, man. Going to jail, everything. Yeah, yeah right. right. <laughs> all right. Our next question is, um, would you rather only be able to listen to music from the 1970s or the 1990s? Ooh. Those the only decades. I'm a '70s ever. guy. Ooh. I grew up in the '70s, so to me, um, I I love it because it it immediately takes me back to being a, a kid. You know, like good. And I had a great childhood growing up on the farm in Minnesota. It was beautiful, and uh, you know, I had a good childhood, good family. Um, and I find the '70s was a really inventive time for the in, just the advancement of the electric guitar and bass mm -hmm. and everything the talk box flanger i mean there're just so many cool inventions that happened um you know this the obviously the 50s and that was kind of the first introduction to rock and roll the 60s was this wild experimental time but i feel like the 70s they really harnessed it like they really brought it into focus and you know listened to records everything from england dan and john fort coley to Aerosmith to obviously Kiss, you know, that, that yeah. there was just, you know, there's, and the, you know, record production got better. Everything about it, I think, stepped up big time. Yeah. Um, and of course, rolled out the carpet for, you know, the eighties, the which was basically my, my generation's version of the sixties, I guess, you know, as it's mm. been said, if you remember the eighties, you probably weren't there. Yeah. <laughs> Especially in Hollywood where, yeah. where so many of us were. Yeah. But, uh, you know, the Motley Crue era of rock and roll, you know, but God yeah. bless them. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I, 70s is easy for me. I'd take that. All yeah. Day. Yeah. So I actually was doing a, an Instagram live just a couple days ago and we were talking about, you know, like the music that, that you grew up on and the music that you love and the music that inspired you. And when my formative years as a bass player, you know, were the late eighties into the early nineties. And so for, so for me, like you talk about that, you know, Alice in Chains and Primus and, and, uh, you know, a, a lot of the Seattle sound, that's a big deal to me. And that's a lot of, you know, a lot of the, when I started making my own musical decisions, not just my, my big brother telling me what to listen to, but when I went, I'm going to listen to that because I like it. I really love a lot of the music from the nineties for that reason. And so it's, it's very important to me, but I will say that I listened back to some of those records and they don't sound that great. Mm -hmm. Like some of the records from the nineties just don't like the, the bass is very thin and buried and, you know, and, and I'm not saying everything, but, but, so to me, I don't know if, if production got a little lazier in that era or what it was, but I love listening to albums from the 70s. I think that there are so many great classic, warm, fat, punchy sounds on some of those records in the 70s. And I think that it was because, like you said, there were a lot of innovations going on. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of engineers at the time were like, you got to check out this new thing, you know? And so they were excited about it and they were really pushing it. And, you know, so... um I don't know. There's some great, like, in some great bass players for me too. Like, I love Chris Squire. I, I'm a big Chris Squire fan, totally, you know. So, totally. so a lot, of, a lot of those, you know, the Yes records from from back then are, are very important to me. And, uh, you know, so I, I don't know. It's that's a hard call because the '90s were like that's my scene. You know, that's like that's that's really yeah. kind of what made me who I am. But I, but I think just sonically, nothing beats that '70s sound. For and sure. you, made, you made an interesting comment. Marty Friedman, who played in Megadeth with me yeah. uh, for 10 years, you know, he said that too. He said, because uh, we, we're, it was funny, he made the comment that there's like a divided camp. There's the Black Sabbath and Kiss side, or you're a Zeppelin Aerosmith guy, right? And then oh, our band, yeah. me and Marty were the Kiss Z Sabbath guys. And at the time, Dave and our drummer yeah. Nick, they were kind of more the Aerosmith Zeppelin guys. And, and I just saw a comment pushed through that someone said the seventies purely for the Sabbath, you know, which is funny. Yeah. Um, but you made a great comment that it's like, you know what, we can't decide when we're born, obviously. So when we come into this world and the things we grow up with and musically speaking, you know, what we listen to um, in our, you know, our early years as a musician there, those formative years, they largely define you know, who we are as musicians. Mm. And granted, we can continue to study and learn and do all these other things. And of course, that'll help our, our skill set. 
But the things that we've kind of first heard when we were getting into playing, it's amazing how they just put this indelible stamp on who we are and kind of what we always reference back to. Like you mentioned, you know, 80s and early 90s. That was kind of that was sort of the defining period that you got you into music. And, yeah. and it probably, you know, I'm sure has influenced your, your playing. And, um, you know, but yeah, you're right. It's funny. The set, the 70s had a really cool period of great bass playing and i think there was this kind of motown thing or something this kind of yeah. 60s james jamerson and then coming into this motown thing and and yeah. i'm with you i'm a chris squire getty guy you know i yeah. love that stuff you know oh what I mean? yeah yeah yeah, yeah those that guys, dirt, that just dirty tone man i love it great yeah. yeah yeah all right we have one final would you rather question and okay. this is would you rather only be able to play with a distortion pedal or with a wah pedal <laughs> oh jeez! <You're> awesome. <laughs> well, if you're a guitar player, the Wawa will hold, you know, hide a multitude of sins. Of uh... <laughs> like, I mean, the same can be said. What 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 I heard? Wawa to guitar is what auto tune to singing is, right? <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. Right? It's the auto tune. Yeah, just it covers there you go. Auto. It covers being. <laughs> covers, and I guess distortion could be the same. Gosh, bass on a wawa on a bass. Yep. Ugh. Yeah. I remember years ago, I, I don't know if you've ever experimented with this, Matt. I remember years ago, um uh Kaler, you know, and, and this was in the 80s, Kaler, mm -hmm. you know, when the Kaler whammy bar came yeah. out. And, and I remember they made one for bass, and I'd stayed up late one night and carved I had a BC Rich Eagle bass, and they took a mm. chisel and a hammer, and I chiseled out to put this Kaler bait, the tremolo on, right? Cause yeah. I thought it'd be awesome. And I spreaded red paint, like blood on it. So it'd look all metal. And, and I got the thing all up and I put strings on it. And as soon as I hit the whammy bar, it just like went boom. And it just died. <laughs> it was like, boom. Some and things it, just aren't meant for bass, yeah, man. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I don't know for me, ladies, I think, I think I would have to take the distortion. I think there's a lot more fun you can have with distortion on it, at least with the bass. Okay. What about and that's you from a guy who it was my whole goal in life is to play as clean as possible. So that that's I'm really pushing it here, right? To yeah. Play with distortion. Um. Yeah. So I used to be in in 100 in, in the clean camp. You know, I like I I didn't want to use any effects at all, and then I started going down the rabbit hole. And now my my pedal board is like it's I, I've had so many stage hands or so you know like people like they're like, are you the guitar player or the bass player? You know, <laughs> like what is that yours? And I'm like. Yes, and yes, I use them all. Yeah. Um, but I really like effects. I've got a really kind of like, you know, um, Juan Alderette, another amazing player. Like, I, I love, uh, loved watching his videos about effects and bass effects and everything he did with it. And um, I'm a big fan of using effects at the appropriate time, serve the song, of course. But one of my favorite things are getting that, like, super beefy, gnarly, uh, kind of Joy Division Cure kind of tone and incorporating mm -hmm. that into our songs. So sure. I have three different. I have a, a Dark Glass Alpha Omega that I love. I have an Aguilar Agro that I love, and um, I'm also using an MXR um, Sub Octave Fuzz. And oh, sometimes yeah. I got all three of them going at the same time. But the thing with us is, you know, with Blue October is the guitar is really just kind of the icing on the cake on a lot of our songs. There's not a lot of heavy guitar on most of our tunes going on. So I get to just really just fill up so much space that I get away with a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, self-serving habits <clears throat> myself, I guess. But yeah. I love love a really really good drivey bass sound I'm a, so you I'm make a, a good point see in my band there's two you know i'm bookended by two guitar players right so i'm yep. living between between the bookends of two big marshall stacks on either yep. side of me yeah and again you're right when when the guitars are dirty the bass has to be clean or it, yeah it helps um and in your band where the distortion is not as heavy on the guitar it gives you a lot of liberty to just fuzz out and go for it oh yeah a lot of stuff you know which yeah. is that's yeah, cool yeah, I got a lot of liberties. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, we are reading the comments. I know a lot of people are yeah. sending stuff in. So Courtney, right? Awesome. I agree. Nathan yeah. talks about Cliff Burton making the wah pedal work with bass. I agree. The fuzz wah. They actually have one. I they I got one of those at NAM one year, the the, the fuzz wah. It was just one of Cliff's. It was cool. But oh, very cool. I yeah, think I gave awesome. it to Mark Mengi in Metal Allegiance because he's a big Cliff fan. So oh, very cool. Yeah. 
he's like you but kind of more like like getting into the pedal board and the fuzz and yeah, <laughs> yeah. and i'm like you step on all those pedals during yeah. the show? really <laughs> <laughs> well david i know we got to let you run in a minute um i guess our final question for both of you is which one of your songs do you feel really lets you shine like as a basis that you look forward to getting to play in the studio on tour you're like this is my moment well, look, it's in, in the Megadeth domain, um, you know, it's it's funny because those songs are written in a way that it reminds me of being in like orchestra band because they're very much written kind of like an orchestra piece. There's mm -hmm. these sort of these intros off and they're kind of these big grand intros and they sort of they're very visually written songs, you know, they're written almost with like a, a, as a movie score, you know, if you can, and right from the very beginning, you know, that we, today, you know, Mustaine was talking about that, right. As we met. Um, and so, you know, I feel like I'm, you know, as in an orchestra, sometimes you're sort of playing the part that's holding it together. Other times you're the featured part. And, mm -hmm. and, um, Chris Adler from Lamb of God had played with us. He played on the last Megadeth record, Dystopia, and then he toured with us for, for a, a short while. And he had mentioned one time we were doing a knot fest down in Mexico City, and he said, he goes, he goes, dude, it must be so cool to be at a bass player in a band like Megadeth because there's so many of these great, awesome bass intros. And I said, what are you mm. talking about? Like, I didn't think about it because I'm the guy playing it, you know? And he said, he goes, think about all the songs in our set that you start, you know, like Wake Up Dead, I see Dawn Patrol is only bass and drums. Uh, Poison was the cure. There's this bass break and Fatal Illusion on the Dystopia record. And, and I thought about it. I go, wow, you're right. Like about probably 10 of the 15 songs we play have these. There's a moment where it's a, a dramatic bass break or an intro or something happens where it all spotlights go to the bass, you know, and. And I, uh, I never thought it so much about me, but it's just, I guess it's the, the role um, in there, you know? So, I mean, there's that, I guess. And, and I think probably the one, you know, I would say, you know, people go, what's your favorite song to play? And my favorite song to play is the one you all like, um, because there's no lonelier feeling than standing on a stage playing a song when everyone's like checking their phone or looking <laughs> at their watch or That's going a great to answer. the bathroom, you know what I mean? So yeah. to me, and you know, for Megadeth, some of those are like Symphony of Destruction, you know, it's just all that, he sells, of course, you know, the Holy Wars, um, you know, the ones that bring everybody together and mosh pits and everybody fists are in the air. I mean, those to me are always the most fun songs to play. Cause quite honestly, we're just the entertainment. You're there to have fun. So we're there to, to make you guys happy. <laughs> yeah. What about you, Matt? Um, I love that answer. That's so true, man. It's like the one that you like, you know, um, I, I, uh, I gotta say for me personally, there's a, there are a couple songs and in, in one, you know, I grew up in Michigan and I grew up, um, I actually grew up kind of confused because I have six sisters and a brother and they all listen to different music but Motown was you know Motown is the Detroit sound and then I had my sisters were into Prince and my brother listened to you and and Iron Maiden and you know and and so I um you know but but I I I really love Motown and I love that Michigan sound. I love James Jamerson. You know, I love some of those iconic bass lines. And we have a song called Debris that I, like, it's so funny. You you said it, you know, you get the intro of the song as a bass player. It's like, here's your intro. Yeah. I get to really lead into that song and I get to do, do this really cool analog delay part that, um, it's not necessarily a flashy part. You know, it's not, it's mm -hmm. not complex. It's not really technical, but it just sounds really effing cool. And I really love playing it, man. I love, I just love that groove and I love setting that tone in that song. And I've had a lot of people tell me, they're like, I love the intro to debris, man. It's so cool. So like for me, that's definitely one of my favorites. I really, I wish we'd play it more. Um, and then I have another, and then my other one is definitely shake it up. And for a completely different reason, it's just because it's so dirty and gnarly and I get to use fuzz and, uh, and I have this old, like early '80s GNL SB2 that the pickups, like it's every other stage, it's so noisy because you know the, there's these old like single coil pickups that are just super buzzy and loud. But I can't replace them because they sound so good, and I can't get that tone without them, you know. So I just I'll kick into that with my pick and just and I love feeling the side fills and feeling like all the bass from that song. And every time we start that, our guitar tech, Chad, we call him the berserker. 
I always see him on the other side of the stage. He's like, <laughs> every time we start that song, and I'm like, that's my boy. Hey, there when you go. can make your band members happy, because they're around yeah. you all the time, they're already sick. We're already sick of each other, right? right? It's like, really, yeah. you again? And when they're over there throwing horns at you, dude, you win. That's awesome. You're good, yeah. It's good like, I, look, I, I can't please you emotionally, but I can you know, hopefully on stage. You know, <laughs> I can rock your world on this I, intro. Yeah. <laughs> I can do it, man. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, th those two are, I, I have to say for me, those are the two, for sure. Awesome. Yeah. So, David, I, I know you got to run. So do, any final thoughts you want to leave us with? Anything you want to plug? Well, Matt, awesome to hang with you and just yeah, have you a, too. Yeah, be, a, be a base brother here today. It was great. Yeah. Annika and Kid Cadet, awesome. Thanks for hitting us. And again, looking at all the comments. I know we've been sitting here riffing between us, but I have been looking at the comments and it's really great. Uh, yeah. Katrine, Elizabeth, Courtney, Nathan, everybody that's been weighing in. Thanks, everybody, for uh, hanging and and uh, really, good, really glad you did this. This is cool. This has been my first con chat. So uh, I hope there will be more of these because obviously we're kind of probably trying to figure out what we're going to do later this year. Well, not us, but the, the convention promoters and everybody's probably mm -hmm. trying to kind of, you know, letting the dust settle and figure out what we're doing. But hopefully we can all be back together. I almost feel like R2-D2 should be kind of buzzing <laughs> up next to me any minute. Or... <laughs> <laughs> so hopefully we'll see everybody soon in the in the big halls and playing concerts and doing conventions and all the fun stuff we get to do. So, Well, thank we you really so much. I think Matt's going to stick around for a little bit, right? Cool. Yeah, yeah. Dave, right. thank you so much, man. Yeah, great Huge to meet fan. you, Matt. Such yeah. an honor. Thanks, man. Yeah, me. have fun. Be safe, everybody. See you later. Bye, baby. Bye. Bye. See ya. All right. Cool. All right. Well, Matt, we got you for, for a couple more minutes, right? Yeah. So, so now, that, so now that he's gone, I can freak out a little bit. I, <laughs> I'm like, I'm such a fan, you know, I, like sweating a lot. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> what a night. What a nice guy. So cool. It's funny. because the, the first time I ever, I, I actually met him at a convention and mm. he, he owns his own coffee line. Uh, and I, I, I know. Yeah. I've seen it. That's great. And the first time I ever had coffee was with David Ellison. So how many people are going to say that? I don't know. Wow, that's pretty cool. And yeah. uh, my mom is chiming in saying, Matt, uh, you were the first concert that she ever attended at age 75. No way. Yeah. Well, really? We went to see you down in Fort Lauderdale. The Wow, that's awesome. Well, that's an honor. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's I think really cool. Thank you. Beach Boys back in the day, but that's, that's all right. <laughs> oh, very cool. Yeah. So um, we had a couple of people asking about you know, ways to kind of stay sane in music during this time. So do you have any suggestions for maybe um, musicians or writers that are just looking for some motivation? You know, I mean, look, uh, something that we were talking about earlier that I think is really true is I think that you can't ever replace the human connection. So, but, but here's the thing. I don't think that that should be an excuse. I don't think that the fact that like you can't sit down in person with somebody and write a song or sit down with your band and jam in person. Um, I don't think that sh you can let that stop you, you know? And, and it's really kind of like, as far as musicians go, it's like, it's kind of sink or swim time. It's like, if you, you don't, and you don't, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do, but if you want to stay productive and you want to like keep challenging yourself yourself and you want to stay active as a writer and you want to kind of stay like, uh, you know, just on top of your game and keep your chops up, I feel like you should be doing exactly what we're doing right now. You should be connecting with people. You should be using, I mean, I don't like, I couldn't even tell you how many zoom meetings I've had in the last three weeks, you know? Um, but, but look, we have all these tools at our disposal now, you know, it's like we have FaceTime, we've got uh, Google hangout, you've got zoom, you've got all these other things that you can do. And to me, if you're going to do, if you're, if you have those tools and you have a guitar or you have a bass or you have a voice, and you have an idea, and you like to work with other people, reach out, you know, reach out to people and see if they want to work with you. Like there's very little latency here. You know, it's like, there's no reason we can't jam. There's no reason that we can't write a song together or work on something together, you know? So I've, I've, I gotta say, I feel like I have been just as busy, uh, with everything and with life, you know, as I did before all this craziness went down, you know, and, um, and I love it. I like to stay busy. I can't like, I'm a busy body. I can't sit still, you know? Um, but I think that it's important that you do what you love and that you stay busy. You have to stay busy with the nest, with the necessities. You have to stay busy to pay the bills and you have to stay busy for all those reasons, but you have to stay busy for your soul. You do, you got to do the things that you love, you know? And so to me, um, 
I love playing music and I love playing my instrument and I love writing music and being creative, you know, so I'm doing a project right now with, with my best buddy, uh, Alan Adams, um, drummer, uh, was tour manager actually for blue October for many years. Um, and he and I have all, you know, just been friends for many, many, many years and have done a lot of uh, creative things together. And so like this whole thing hit and we were like, let's, let's work on music, man. You know, like there's no reason that we can't be continuing to make progress and work on songs together. It's just the two of us. It's not that complicated. It's not like getting five people on a, on a meeting, <laughs> you know? Um, and so we've actually been able to make a ton of progress while this has been going on. And, and so that's kind of, you know, it's a silver lining thing for me, honestly, making, I'm making some progress with this record. Excited that's about awesome. it. Well, yeah. What can you tell us about the record? Um, okay. So the project is called Icarus Bell. And, uh, we have, um, we have an Instagram account. We're going to, we actually have a website that's going to be launching shortly. Um, we are going to be doing, you know, a lot of the things that you see with a lot of bands right now, we're going to be doing those things for sure. Um, as far as getting the information out there and just spreading the word, you know, but it's coming from a place for us of like, there's no, like, like we are, we're older gentlemen <laughs> that are very comfortable in our own skin. You look and, like you're 17. And, you oh about? my God. I love you. Let's keep talking. <laughs> um, Baby. <laughs> well, we're, we're, we're a couple older dudes and, and, you know, and we have families and we're very, very happy with our lives. And so we're like, we're just doing this music for us. You know, there's no other reason for it. There's no like, we're trying to get signed, man, or we're trying to, you know, it's like that. No, it's just, let's make a record. We have, we have the capability to do that. Let's write some songs that we love. Let's kind of get back to that night. Like we were talking about the nineties earlier. Let's get back to some of those bands that, we really grew up uh, worshiping and loving and kind of like harness that sound, but with some modern flair and let's do our thing. And so we're doing this, like we're making this record that I'm super proud of because there are no borders at all as far as what we can do with it, because there's no, we're not trying, we're not worried about like trying to get a song on the radio or anything like that. It doesn't matter to us, you know? So like, even like today we we're talking about the song that we're working on the song's gonna be like 12 minutes long. And there's a section where there's, we're gonna have Ryan play strings. And then we're gonna have a section where we're gonna have a horn section at the end. And oh, then it ends what? with an acoustic guitar. And it's like, this is like, to me, it's like, let's get weird, man. <laughs> the world is weird right now. Let's get weird. Let's like, let's do everything that we, we've always wanted to do, but have never been able to do. 2020, let's get weird. Yeah, for sure, <laughs> you know, so, <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, again, you know, it, um, Icarus Bell official is an Instagram. Go check it out. There's some, there are some snippets on there, so you can hear a little bit of the drum and bass tones and a little bit of vocals. Um, but we're we're just taking our time with it, and eventually we'll have a whole record done. And yeah, I can't wait for people to hear it. Can you see Icarus Bell going on tour with Blue? Sure. Hell yeah, I could see that, you know? I mean, one thing I got to say is, and I haven't even begun to think about this, is I have no idea how in the hell we're going to pull these songs off live because there's just two of us and there are a lot of layers. There's there, Some of these songs got a lot of guitars and a lot of vocals. And so, you know, I mean, we'll cross that bridge when we get to it. But, you know, I would love to play, I'd love to play some shows at some point, you know? And, and if we could, um, obviously, the one the beautiful thing about with Blue October is that you know, we all are, we're a family. We're not a band. We really are a family. We're this huge extended family. Um, and, and everybody's so supportive of every other, of each other. And so when like, when Ryan does a meeting place record and Will has a solo record or Harvard at the South and Justin, you know, he, he does a lot of solo stuff. Everybody's like, we show up to each other's shows and we play in each other's bands and we do like, we all do this stuff together because we love each other, you know? So, I, I, at some point, yeah, if, if it made sense and, and, uh, and it, there were some shows that they wanted us to do and we were able to pull it off. Hell yeah. That'd be fun. Why not? That's awesome. Yeah. We'll see. I, I, I believe I saw yesterday, um, blue October is launching. Is it a streaming service? Is that what's going on or? Oh, I don't know anything about that, about the streaming service. The only thing that I'm privy to right now in, 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 in blue October worlds, I know that we just put our acoustic, um, Oh my, my out, which mm -hmm. is pretty awesome. Um, Speaking of busybodies, Justin is the ultimate busybody. Like and when I hang out with him, I'm like, I'm a little more chill than I thought I was. <laughs> uh, 
Justin's like yeah. live every day. <laughs> yeah, he is a walking coffee ad. Um, <laughs> we'll have to get him some Ellison coffee, you know? We'll yeah, that's awesome. Him up. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I know that, I, I mean, look, he, he has a million things going on at once, you know, so it doesn't surprise me. Um, but I, I do know that one thing that he's been really active with, of course, especially with everything happening, going down the way that it has is, is not letting that slow him down and not, you know, like being able to connect with people and put on shows. So he's been doing some, some shows via stage it, and he's been doing a lot of stuff live on Instagram, Facebook. He's doing a lot of stuff to, to stay connected with people. And he's really, really, really good about that. Way better than, than the rest of us <laughs> for sure. Yeah. But you're doing this. So I mean, like, I love this. This is like, I would do this every Saturday if I could, man, this is okay. like, I love okay. it. <laughs> we're, we're available. This is we're, awesome. We're, we're yeah. Money, but you know, we'll make yeah. it happen. Yeah. No, this is awesome. Thank you for having me. It's great. Thank you. Okay. I have one kind of like weird question. And I think I might have even asked you the last time I was in the studio with you. Yeah. So, as a bassist, mm -hmm. what is the biggest like request that you get when someone's like, oh, can you play this bass line? Like, is it like the Seinfeld theme or is it? Oh my gosh. The guy, <laughs> you know, it's funny. There was another bass player. Was it Rob Trujillo from Metallica? I think it may have been him. That they said that his band nicknamed him Seinfeld when he would slap. And I can't, and I laughed so hard when I read that because I, I was like, I'm not alone. I'm not the only one. The guys used to give me so much grief over that and call me Seinfeld when I would slap. Um, especially Justin would give me a hard time. Actually, Jeremy, drummer, gives me a really hard time about it. He always jokes with me about it. Bang, bang, bang. That's what he says all the time. Um, <laughs> bang, bang, bang. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but but as far as like a part that people are like a um, a line that people like request, like a non Blue October song. Um, yeah. We did a benefit. So I did a benefit show. This is really funny. Um. I, and I'm totally blanking on the name of the song, but it, the name of the song does not even matter because the story is fantastic. So we did this show, this benefit show um, after Hurricane Katrina, and Matthew McConaughey hosted it. And um, I did it with my friend Casey McPherson. It wasn't with Blue October. It was my friend Casey McPherson and Alpha Rev. And so I got to play bass during that set. And um, it was this really cool event, downtown Austin. And and we got done, and, and we're hanging out. And Matthew McConaughey was like... Um, Hey man, you were laying it down, man. That was awesome. Bass man. You know, and I was like, this is so crazy. I love First this. First of all, Matt, are you an impressionist? Because that was very good. That was pretty good. <laughs> I've never really tried to do Matthew McConaughey before. Lies. But, um, but that, that was great. But okay. he he like I, you know, but I'm like, okay, cool. Thanks, man. And he is like, uh, he's like, Do you know how to play that 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 Edgar Winter song? And he like said the title and I, I, I right. Was it? I don't. I don't even. I don't think it was Frankenstein. No, no it was I like know. I'm just naming a song. I mean, you would think it would be right, but maybe. I whatever. Maybe it was, but I was just so like in the moment that I didn't even. It just went right over my head. But it was just so funny to me, and you know? I was like that Matthew McConaughey is re is making a bass request <laughs> right now. You know, like yeah, let me just go grab my bass and do some bass karaoke for you. It was pretty funny. I would have been like, um, can you do one of your famous lines? <laughs> all right, yeah. all right, all right. Yeah. Well, all right, all right. Yeah, it's like, you know, I could have gone there. Maybe I should have. Yeah, but no. Yeah. I, I think the song I requested from you was Higher Ground. I think that was the one I was like, oh, oh yeah. That's ground? that's one of the first songs I ever learned, actually. You know. <laughs> um in fact, I tried to show that to my daughter the other day and she was not interested at all because I'm showing her bass lines, you know, and I'm like, OK, let's do some of the classics, Smoke on the Water, you know, Another One Bites the Dust, like, you know, some 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 very like iconic classic bass lines that are pretty easy to, to, to grab a hold of and learn, you know, some good fundamentals. And then I'm like, oh, higher ground. And she's like, Meh, I don't care. Show me some Billie Eilish. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, like, Billie's pretty sweet. So. OK, yeah. <laughs> Danica, do you remember the first song you learned how to play? On guitar? Yeah. I, I play guitar. Um, uh, well, on piano, it would have been a Beatles song. But um, guitar, uh, my brother taught me how to play Over the Hills and Far Away. There that's you go. A, that's a hard yeah. fucking song, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. that's that's a hard one. I didn't, I didn't, didn't jam it out. It's pretty great. <laughs> that's awesome. Mine was Celebrity Skin from Hole. 
Oh, that's great. Can we brag about that? That's the first song I learned how to play. <laughs> that's fantastic. I love that. One that I learned by myself, of course, was Say It Ain't So from Weezer. But No, that that's one of my favorite guitar lines ever, actually. That's awesome. And that's one of the few I can actually play, too. So <laughs> I play a lot of guitar, like studio guitar. I've, I've done a lot of the guitar parts with, with Blue October over the years. And, um, and then, uh, like, with this, the thing that Alan and I are doing, I'm doing – the majority of the guitars, but I'm a, I'm not a real guitar player. You know, yeah. somebody's like, Oh, play the, you know, the diminished blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I don't know what that means. Yeah. Like, I, I love just, that song. I just do. My yeah. Time. Yeah. Like, yeah, it's so good. <laughs> I'll do like five parts that become one part and they all make sense at the end of the day. You know, that's yeah. Stunt guitar. That's what it is. Got it. <laughs> so, uh, before we wrap this up, any final Ooh. thoughts, anything you want to plug, what you got going on? Well, I mean, you um, you kind of let me plug uh, my project, so thank you for that. You know, definitely go check it out. Um, I would say, uh, you know, hopefully the studio is, is up and running here before long, which I, th I think it will be. Um, but like everybody else, we're going to have to take it slow and be very careful and cautious and sanitary. You know, like a lot of a lot of people. But we're we're definitely following the rules. You know, so um, Orb Recording Studios, that's my spot in Austin. Um, yeah, there it is right there. Go check yeah. it out if you get a chance. Um, you know, really, really proud of it. We've been open six years and we've worked with some of the biggest and best bands and artists in the world. And, uh, you know, I think that I, I, I just have this feeling that we're going to get some of the best recorded music we've ever had over the next six months. Because when studios, a lot of people record at home, which is great, so we're already getting some. But when commercial studios start opening up again and start getting back to business, you have so much creative energy and so much emotion that's bottled up and so many artists that can't go out and do what we used to take for granted. You can't go out and do that right now. So what are you going to do with it? You got to record it. You got to put it down. And you have, and people have a lot to say. You know, there's a lot of tragedy in the world right now. And there's a lot of brotherhood. And there's a lot of like just people coming together. You know, so I think that there, there's a lot coming out of this that I, I just feel like it's a really, it's just a really profound time. So I think that we're going to wind up over the next few months with some of the, like, some of the greatest recordings ever, you know? So I just happen to have a studio. So if you want to record one hey. of those greatest songs ever, come do it at one of the greatest studios ever. And I can vouch that your studio is incredible and amazing. And everyone that works there, Matt Melly, I mean, everyone there is so fantastic. Thank so. you. Appreciate Absolutely. it. Danica, any final thoughts? Anything you want to plug? Well, now I got to get up to Austin because it's not that far away. So. <laughs> yeah, you're like what two and a half hours away, yeah. right? Yeah, let's do there it. you go. Woo. Oh man. Um, other things to plug? Oh, uh, theater nerd podcast, dude. We um we're doing ten minute plays now. One is releasing every Friday, um, and we're getting together and doing a full radio play that's a two-act play and we're doing like a whole soundscape design is getting done for it and it's gonna be fucking baller that's I'm awesome really loop, loop. i love that <laughs> yeah. awesome so, thank you that's awesome danica i'm so proud of you i'm so proud of both of you <laughs> and um galaxy con is a lot of really really cool stuff coming up so make sure to check out galaxycon.com we have actually they're going to be start doing like one-on-one -on -one conversations or three-on-one conversations. I know we have the kids from it coming up. We have my hero academia. So once again, check out galaxycon.com. We have an entire schedule that, that is up now. Um, Danica and I on Monday have Joey Fatone and Chris Jericho followed by and a week of incredible streams next week is going to be epic. So um, I think we did it, Matt. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. This is awesome. Like I said, any, anytime, any anytime you need me, please let me know. I love I love joining you guys. So much fun. It's just so good to it's just so good to talk to people. <laughs> I know. This is this has definitely been like the things and Danica and I say we look forward to this every week. Yeah. We love this. We love like getting to talk to you and pick your brain and and see all of your friends and fans and family, you know. Yeah. And, it's really incredible. So oh, thank you guys so much. And, and I do, I want to give a shout out to get back up TV dot TV as well. Um, yes, driver, driver girl. Thank you for, for reminding me about that. Definitely check that out. That's a very, very cool thing. I think a lot of people need to talk right now. There are a lot of, you know, we are, we're all going through some, some, some mental things right now some mental health things i think talking about that and connecting with other people is so important right now so go check that out absolutely 
Awesome. Well, on that note, we will see you guys on Monday and have an amazing rest of your weekend, guys. All right. Thank let's you, guys. Oldest end footage. Thanks again for tuning in to GalaxyCon Live. Make sure to check out our online store at galaxycon.myshopify.com where you can find t-shirts, signed and certified Funko Pops, autographs, collectibles, and more. For updates on the upcoming streams, visit us on Facebook at GalaxyCon Live or galaxycon.com.